All right, we're ready to start session number, what is it, five? Four. Four, session number four. It's hard to read in this dim light. It's really dark. <laughs> yeah, session number four for the book of Acts. Uh, tonight, we're not going to fin finish Acts. We're actually only, only going to hit Peter's first sermon. Uh, that's what we're going to cover. We're probably trying to cover uh, about, chat, about verses 14 through 36. A very interesting piece of scripture here that... Uh, we introduced last week, uh, and we remember as we're going through this, the Holy Spirit has come now, uh, and then we had those people speaking in tongues. Uh, they were basically not speaking in tongues like people think. They were actually speaking in foreign languages that the people could understand all over that came into Jerusalem uh, for, for the Pentecostal feast. Uh, they all came in to Jerusalem. They're all there, and they're here in their own native languages. Uh, it's different than what we get today in a lot of the Pentecostal teaching that say you must be talking in tongues in order to communicate with God. Uh, there are some Pentecostals that actually teach you have to talk in tongues or you're not, you're, you don't have salvation. Uh, none of that is supported by anything that we read in Acts uh, I'm not going to go there on, on that doctrine or, or theology, but the fact is they weren't doing gibberish. They weren't doing a noise that only that person and God understood. These were Galileans for the most part, very uneducated fishermen, thought of as very low of the lowest class, could barely even speak their own language, much less fluently speak any other language. So they were all amazed by what was going on. And so what we, what we ran into is people were amazed, uh, and there were people that when they were amazed, there was also people mocking what was going on. And as we left it, they were mocking, basically saying, these men are all drunk. And that's where we left last week. So with that, we'll start with verse 14. <coughs> Excuse me. Verses 14 through 21. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servant and on my maid servant, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I remember when I was a kid, we chuckled and got in the back of the church and turned to Acts 2.15 um, to, to look at where they weren't drunk because it was only the third hour. So, and we thought that was really funny. So I, my question is, why would they say it's not possible to be drunk because it's only the third hour? Any ideas? Um, why that's phrased that way and why that that's when he says that thing. Because I'm sure, it, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to make a joke about it. I was going to say, because the, the wine was still warm, wasn't cold, cool enough. Yeah, it hadn't <laughs> cooled yet. I mean, you, Dave and I kind of joke about this one bar out near where we are and at 10 o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock people are there and I'm like, oh my goodness, how could, how sad that, or he's even like, we were there like 7.30 or 8.30 people are there already. Maybe they're still there, I don't know, from the night before, <laughs> but, um, you know, so obviously people can drink anytime they want, but the reason that they said this is because no Jew, devout Jew or, or you know, just Jew by birth and not by practice, no Jew would eat or drink anything before the third hour, which was about nine o'clock in the morning. And so um, it just was really unheard of. Uh, the hours from about the time they woke from about six until nine were devoted to prayer um, and the business of God. 
And it just was a custom, not really, not necessarily just religious. There was just nobody would even think about eating. So he's like, okay, come on. We know no, they're not drunk. They haven't had anything to drink. It's only nine in the morning. Um, so, so that was that. Um, one thing I, that Dave had mentioned that they were speaking in tongues, which alerted the crowd and people from all of these vast nations um, and brought them to gather and, and be curious. Um, notice that the speaking of tongues terminated when Peter started get stood up to talk. And um, it does say that Peter was standing up with the 11. So I think all 12 of the disciples, the new, newly elected Matthias and Peter and the rest were standing there. And then Peter launched into his sermon. Um, but the, the reason that he was he gives for not being drunk, not that they wouldn't drink the wine, um, but because um, it just it was not a practice. It just they mentioned it was new wine, and there are some commentators that took that and said, "Well, new wine doesn't have very much alcohol in it," uh, and so they were mocking them that they were getting drunk off of grape juice. Uh, so this was a pure a pure mockery going on. Uh, but the fact is, yeah, were, were there alcoholics during this time period? Yes. Were there people that uh, drank more than they should? Yes. The Bible's repeatedly saying it's a sin to be drunk. Not a sin to drink, but it's a sin to overdrink. And so, yes, that was going on during this period. But very unlikely at nine o'clock in the morning, if this was all Jews, and it was, this is a Jewish festival, there were probably not many Gentiles there. And the 120 that were in the upper room when, when this was going on were all definitely Jews. So when you look at that, it, you've got to look at it and say, it's just people trying to make light of what happened. And like you said, what happened, we had this great wind come in, great noise. It was a, like a wind, but it really wasn't a wind. And that noise attracted people along. And when they came in, they heard all this speaking in different languages, and they were all astonished by it. But to correct, and I think this is the case, I've listened to several commentators that said they were speaking in these tongues and preaching the gospel to the 3,000 people. That is not what it says, and that's not what most commentators said. We went into this last week. That's not really what it says that was going on. They were preaching that they were, but it was Old Testament. As you move into this sermon of Peter's, he's talking about the last days. And he says, what does the term last days mean? And so does anybody really understand what that term means? It's used all over the place, really in the Old Testament, but also used in, in the New Testament. What exactly is that referring to? Well, my comment on that is it's referring to God's timetable, not ours. And that there's two days left from the time Jesus went back to heaven and the, uh, when he comes back. Yeah, I, I think there's the validity in that, Charlie. But, but what they were saying uh, is in the Old Testament, the last days, or they start when the Messiah comes. And so pretty much all the commentators were in agreement that the last days started when Jesus started his ministry. Not when he was ascended, but the last day started when the Messiah was on earth and started his ministry and started doing the miracles. That was the start of the, of the last days. And the last days really refer to the Jews. And it, the last day is the time of the Messiah is on earth until the time of the new kingdom and Jerusalem is, and the Jews are, are, are all back up under uh, one kingdom. The whole earth is up under one kingdom. It's the millennium, millennial period. And so you have this time span that's actually been now 2,000 years. It's called the age of the church or the church age. That's what we're in. So this last time, these last times really refer to this span of time 
from the time Messiah's first coming all the way until his second coming. And so we don't know how many days that will be. Actually, when you go back into the, uh, the, the epistles of John, 1 John 2.18, John doesn't refer to it as last days, but he refers to it as last hours. And he says last hours, many antichrists will come. And many antichrists have already come. Well, wow, that was 90 AD that that was written. You know, that was 1850 years ago that was written. And there were already antichrists coming in, into the picture. So this last day's period is what we can gather uh, is pretty much from the start of Jesus's ministry, which is the start of the Messiah in, in, in corned form on earth as a human being until his second coming. And included in that period, is obviously his uh, crucifixion, his resurrection, and his ascension. All those things are in the last day period. Right, um, Dave, the last hour phrase, that's in um, Revelation? No, that's in uh, 1 John, I think, chapter 2, 18, I think is what it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> So next, are we ready? First John what? First John chapter 2, 18, I think. Thank you. So what is the theme of this passage of Joel? So this is where we've got, it's really quite remarkable. We've got Peter quoting the Old Testament. Now, remember, they coming from Galilee. They were simple men. And this would have been really quite amazing to the crowd realizing if they even knew him that he was a fisherman and not a rabbi that he would be quoting um joel one of the minor prophets um and so what is the theme of this passage in joel i always kind of wondered i never really grasped uh verse 17 that I would pour out of my spirit. I got that part, but then upon all flesh. I never I'll, grasped that. <laughs> okay, and I'll pour, I'll pour it out a little bit later, just a little, in that couple of verses down. Um, I'll, I'll just start with that since you said that. Basically, but, I mean, the, the to me, whole, that's kind of the theme, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. That is the yeah. theme. That exactly it is. There's, it's, Joel spent a lot of time. Um, talking about judgment and things coming to ancient Israel for the way they had turned away from God and things. Um, but then there are a few spots where he's giving promise and hope. And here he's, he's talking about the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. People did, I mean, point out, okay, is this all people? It says that um, I would put my, my spirit out on all flesh. But if we go down just to verse 18, He's on my men's servants and on my maid servants. I will pour out my spirit in those days. So what defines a men's servant and a maid servant? Well, that would be a servant of God. And so all flesh, you know, the criminal down the street or the thief down over here or the whatever, um, I don't, the spirit is not being poured out on every living flesh, but it's poured out on all the flesh of the maidservants and manservants um, of God. Yeah, and we had differences of opinion from our commentators that we follow. You know, some, Robert, were saying this is all flesh, but what it is is the opportunity for all flesh to receive it, not that all flesh will. God will pour out his spirit for the possibility of all flesh to be saved. Because, it, you know, we go back to John, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And it's, he lo so loved the world. It's the whole world. So he, he loves all of his creation, believers and non-believers. So that was one take on it, uh, that it's all flesh, but it's only those that, that actually believe, that actually receive the Holy Spirit. But the opportunity is there for everyone. So uh, again, you get into a little bit difference of, of opinion. I do, the way I look at that is kind of the way Annette summed it up. Uh, it is believers that he's pouring his Holy Spirit out on, 
it's not all flesh that's there. Uh, that's just the way that, that I look at it. One thing we, we miss here is, is that Joel was prophesizing, and this is now actually historical in his prophecy. So when Joel says this, the Holy Spirit has come. It just came. So this was why Peter's actually using this. It's because he's using Joel's prophecy, Joel's prophecy. Part of it has been accomplished because the Holy Spirit has came, right? The other part of it is still prophecy. When you look at, I will show wonders in heaven above and, uh, and signs on earth below, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moons into blood, and before the coming of the great and the awesome day of the Lord. Whoop! Wait a second. We've gone to the last days, and now Joel was, ta Joel was talking about the day of the Lord. Those are two entirely different things. Don't miss that. So this last this section is really prophesizing of end times, whereas the first section is prophesizing the coming of the Holy Spirit upon all mankind, an opportunity to receive the Holy Spirit. So that's how actually Peter divided this up. And so we can mm -hmm. miss it if we're not careful. But the day of the Lord, that's the day Jesus returns. That's the, when we talk about the day of the Lord, that's, that's judgment, that's the, the destruction. And so that's, that day is very well known. It's called Jacob's trouble. And so that is the end days. So he's using this in a real, I guess, intelligent way, showing first he's going back to Old Testament. He's going back to something they know. They, they, they are all Jewish people, all familiar with the teaching. So he's going back and pulling that in and saying, hey, that prophecy in Joel, this is already accomplished. It's happening. You've seen it. You've heard it. This is yet to come. So it's really a good way to look at it. And that's really ingenious by Peter to be able to pull that together. And it's not Peter. It's the Holy Spirit. Let's give credit where, where credit is due. Okay, the next section of, of scripture is, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified, put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. So this is uh, 20 through 28. So really, what does... Uh, what are, what are really the definition of miracles, signs, and wonders? Well, the supernatural manifestations of God, you know, uh, making himself known to man. Yeah, and I think, Robert, you actually probably actually just accurately describe, describe miracles. It's things that are, we would deem impossible. Only a higher being, a God, could intervene and, and create miracles. But there's a lot of difference between miracles and wonders and signs. Okay, let, let's talk about wonders and I'll come back to signs. 
They're, they're called the seven wonders of the world. Right. Right? Okay, wonders are something that is we are amazed by. If I look at Niagara Falls, I get it's a wonder looking at how these massive amount of water comes down. We're amazed by it. So wonders are different than miracles. They're an amazement, and they may be of God. They may be associated with a miracle, or they may not. If you look at, like I said, the seven wonders of the world, those are not necessarily God miracles. That's wonders that people can't believe how they how they happen, but they were happened by, by men's hands. Signs, on the other hand, what do signs normally do? They point. They point to something. One way, or they tell you to stop, or the grocery store is this way, or to go to Jerusalem, go this way, a sign that way. It points to something. Here, the signs are really pointing to spiritual. So miracles, we're, we have amazed by these miracles, but usually miracles and signs, signs point in, in this reference, even though they point to many different things, a sign in itself is a sign. It's not the object. For example, a sign pointing to Jerusalem is not Jerusalem. All it is is a sign pointing to something else. Well, signs are pointing to our spiritual growth. So the miracle helps us with signs and showing us to grow in, in, miracle, uh, in, in miracle growth. So that's, I, I myself didn't, was confused at how these were actually laid out, but that's how, that's the best explanation we got out of the commentators. But they are, all three are different. And there's different definitions if you want to go look at them. Uh, those are the ones that we came up with, but they're all somewhat different and unique from one another, even though they can all be included in one happening. It, this was this was God's plan. This was God's plan, and he, want, he did it this way. This was his way. He's got his mark on this. Yeah, and Bobby, what's happening here is a couple of things here. And I'm going, to, I'm going to leave this to the next question for, for Annette, because that's what we get into. Remember, he's telling these Jewish people, this Jewish crowd, that this man, Jesus, Jesus, by whom you saw miracles and wonders and signs. So they, they were actually eyewitnesses of what was going on. He's putting that right in their face. So with that, we'll go to the next question. So my, the next question is, what's Peter doing here in this, this section of scripture um, regarding Jesus of Nazareth, which this is one of like the eighth time that this, this moniker is used to describe Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, um, and the Jews. Um, what's he doing? Do you notice? Well, isn't he making it known to them that he is the Messiah? I mean, he said, the man God attested by God to you. Uh, to me, he's, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I'm no, that's it. Right. He is exactly what he's doing, and he is using God. But in this section, what he's doing is contrasting Jesus of Nazareth with the Jews. He's doing a contrast between the Jews prided themselves on um, holding the law or possessing the law. Although they didn't spend an enormous, a lot of them did not spend a lot of time obeying the law. They just felt I like they that. were privileged <laughs> because they possessed the law. So what Peter here is doing is saying, God raised this man up. You know, you killed this man. God raised this man. You, um, you know, you despised him. God lifted him up or God attested him. You put him to death. God gave him life. And so he's, they're going through and doing, um, uh, he's showing how the Jews are separated from God. They're completely separate things. So great, they have the law. That law does not bring them to God. Uh, it, it, it's more than that. And so um, that, that's what, what he's doing here is drawing this contrast and showing them how far from God they are. Yeah, and Robert, as you said, he's, he's pointing 
this Jesus of Nazareth. This G- he uses Jesus of Nazareth many times throughout the Acts. And what we're seeing here is, as we said, he's pointing to them saying, this man, Jesus of Nazareth, who you saw do miracles and signs and wonders, you, you knew had to be by God. Why you knew it? Remember Nicodemus that came to Jesus at night? So we know you must be from God. No one could do these things unless God was in him. They knew that God was in him. And so Peter is just pointing that out. The other thing that's important, though, is verse 22. We're now moving out of preaching Judaism and Old Testament and Old Covenant. And we just made a transition in the New Testament, New Covenant. So don't, don't miss that. We just made that transition because all up to this time before, we were talking Old Covenant, Old Testament, prophecy of Jesus coming, the Messiah, the last days of Joel, Joel's Old Testament, minor prophet. All old, Now the gospel is starting to be proclaimed. And Peter is boldly standing up and telling them, you killed your Messiah. Now, remember, they just put him up, they just crucified him about 50 days before this, right? So that's very bold of Peter to stand up and do that, the risk. Remember, this is the same Peter that denied Christ three times. You know, so remember, something's happened to Peter here. He's a changed man. So a new creation. Today? Yeah, go ahead. He's a new creation. He is a new creation. That's exactly right. But he's a brand new creation. And with that, this next question, I'm going to hit something I never thought of before. But what are these pains of death? What is it referring to? Being captured or held forever? It, it could be, but this word that's used, if you go back into the Greek, that it, look at the trans- translation of it, it actually means birth pains. What? That's what it means. Mm-hmm. So it's talking about birth pains of death that we could not hold him down. And I, I missed it completely, but several commentators pointed it out. Do your own study here. You come to your own conclusion. But what it's talking about is Jesus had to go through these pains of death birth pains of death in order to come out and be resurrected as a new being. We had a spirit, God, the spirit, the the son of God, the spirit, the Holy spirit, a spirit, angels or spirits. We had human being that was flesh that wasn't of the spirit until we received the Holy spirit. Now Christ is bringing us a new being being created through his crucifixion and he taken on our sins. We we now have a new body that we will get our resurrected body one day that has the same nature and powers as you saw Christ appear to the disciples behind closed doors all of a sudden he appeared. It's not a three-dimensional body or four-dimensional or five-dimensional. Some people, some commentator says that it's a seven or eight-dimensional being, and that's what was created through this process that is being given to each believer. Again, that's kind of far-fetched. I never heard that before. And so I bring it up to you. You do your own research there. But that's what's happening here. According to many commentators, it's a new form of being being created out of Christ that now promises that form of being to each believer when we have our resurrected bodies and we're joined with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in heaven. I've never heard that before. Well, I haven't either, but first time for everything. (laughs) What what is a seven seven and and eight dimensional body anyway? 
Can you explain that? I don't, I don't know what that Something is. Outside of what we understand of time and space. It's well, three, three dimensional. You can, you, you know, what I, three dimensional is. I got that, but yeah. When you get into four dimensions and five dimensions and six dimensions, I, we can't, I can't that, comprehend it. Like quantum physics. It's, you know, quantum physics gets into four dimensions. Uh, actually, I think it's Paul talks about four dimensions in, the, uh, in Romans or Corinthians. Uh, I, I'm not going to go there. That was somebody bringing that up. That may or may not be true. I, I know where it is, but I can't pick it up. So, but once you get out in four dimensions and five dimensions, it's very difficult for the human mind to comprehend because all we know is three dimensions here on earth. But they say heaven's not bound by those three dimensions. I mean, the universe is not bound by that. It's, it's, we have no concept, uh, no capabilities of comprehending these dimensions that are in the universe, which we will experience through Christ. Like one person explained it one time that if, with added dimensions, you can be in more than one place at one time. So that if we go into these, we're talking about stuff that we don't know. So anybody that might listen to this and knows quantum physics and things would probably be shaking their head at us. It's just, we heard somebody speaking on it, but he was a physicist. Yeah, right. Yeah, he was a physicist that was speaking of this, but um, it's really beyond, we can't really adequately give you the definitions of that it's just beyond our comprehension nor have i done enough research to actually give you an intelligent right response we're just parroting back so yeah. we don't really know i, I, go I, I got that because i i got i got lost i really did <laughs> well i could I, i'm going like what the heck and then robert school is robert Annette, no i'm not school i'm just throwing something out there you just <laughs> mentioned being two places at one time well, Ephesians 2, we've talked about before, says that we are seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. You know, I mean, and you know, the, the scripture tells us that he's at the right hand of the Father in heaven, but it also says Christ in you. Many places talks about him being in us. So I think these things kind of touch on what you're talking about, the spiritual overriding our, our, our physical uh, dimensions. That's good. That's yeah. very good. I'm going to go on to the next question because I, I, I'm i going to present to you what one of the commentators said. So what did, da what did David in this passage mean that the Lord was always before his face? I think this is debatable. So I have an answer from a commentator, but I think I think it's going to be better answered when Dave goes on to the next question. So what do you think David meant by the Lord was always before his face? He always got his back. Um, the, okay. The, that he's always there watching out for him. Um, we had one person said that this is pointing towards salvation. That it's a, it's a reference to salvation, that God is our strength, and that he accepts, and that David is accepting responsibility for his failings and knows that God will raise him up. Um, that is what he is saying that this means. And I'm gonna just go ahead and defer and let Dave go right in the next question, because I think it has a lot more to do with the answer to Dave's question than what that commentator had presented. Yeah, and if we, we go back to the scripture we're talking about, if you look at verse 25, for David says concerning him. Capital. Him is capitalized, right? So David, so the question is, is David talking about himself? No. David's talking about the Messiah, the Jesus, Jesus. And so a lot of times when we read Psalms, this is quite common for David. And David, for most people, David's a prophet, even though we don't look at it that way. Uh, but He's basically prophesizing uh, about the Messiah. You say, well, is he really a pro Well, yeah, go back to Psalm 22. My, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? I cry out to you in the daytime, you do not hear. Then I see that I'm not silent, but you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. 
and it goes on for about 40 verses. It's all Christ. It's Christ on the cross. It talks about dividing his clothes. It talks about casting lots. Oh, uh, that's David in Psalm 22. Read it. Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 are two prophecies about Christ and his death that just will blow you away when you read those. So it's quite common for David to be prophesied by the Messiah. So is David talking about himself? No, he's not. This is actually, he's talking about, I foresaw the Lord, the Messiah, always in my face. Remember, Messiah is going to be the human seed from David. Not necessarily from David's uh, masculine side. It's actually Mary is a seed of David as well. And so, because you'll find people that say, oh, well, Christ didn't come from David because Joseph was the seed of David and Joseph wasn't the father of Christ. Well, he didn't impregnate Mary. That's true. You got me. No, you don't. Mary is a seed of Christ as well. You go back to her genealogy and she's also a seed of Christ. So the Christ comes from David's seed. We think it came from Joseph. That's the way we think about it, but doesn't it came from Mary. So what he's talking about here is really, he's talking about really, if you get down to verse 27, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One. David can't be talking about him and saying he's a Holy One. My God, David sinned as bad as anybody could sin, right? I mean, what he did with Bathsheba, what he did with her husband. I mean, David is as bad as, as bad as they are. But God used him, and David is still saved, even though I, I think he's saved. And I think well, he'll be in heaven just as well. But the fact is, he's not talking about himself. He's very much pointing to God's Holy One. He's very much pointing to the Messiah. So I think, again, it's ingenious that you have this uneducated fisherman, Peter, that's pulling scripture out, Psalms, that David wrote, and he's teaching these Jewish people what these Psalms mean. It points to the Messiah, and the very Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, that you crucified. That's what, that's what he's give, coming across here. So as we finish this, we'll go to the, next, the closing set of uh, scriptures. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on the throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This, Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all of the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Amen. So, Peter's sermon, is it, is it about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? And I'm just going to answer, no, obviously right here it is not. So, he... Every good sermon has certain structure um, that, you know, you have your kind of opening and then you have your probably three points and then you have your wrap it up or conclusion. So the Joel reference was kind of the prelude um, where the, the promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and that is how they got to where they were at that moment. The rest of this sermon here, we're seeing he is talking about Jesus Christ, the man, the the. God in the flesh, 
that you crucified, that you, um, um, what word I want to say, were rejected. Or- they rejected and um, schemed against and set up and, and you know, just tried to ruin this Messiah um, you killed, you crucified. So his whole sermon here, this whole thing is he's preaching Jesus Christ. And I go on to the next question. What four things um, did he use to prove that Jesus was the Messiah? Number one, he proved his life that God did signs and wonders through Jesus Christ, pointing, pointing to the, the miracles um, show the power of God. The signs point back to spirituality and, and point back to God. The wonders, people just can't come up with an explanation. Um, so he used his life. The next thing he did is he used his death. And they all knew his death because they were responsible for his death. They witnessed his death. They called for his death. So um, he used their death. The third thing he used was the resurrection. There was no question. They saw him. He said, we are all witnesses. He did come back. And after the crucifixion, and we are witnesses that he was um, resurrected. Um, only God can be resurrected. And then um, his, the, fourth, the fourth point would be his exaltation or his glorification when um, God called him from this earth and took him back up to sit at the right hand of God. So these are the four things that Peter used to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. So was Peter really concerned about the political correctness of, of what he was preaching? <laughs> no. no. Peter was and never Peter, politically correct. Peter was yeah. walking in the light. Peter was walking in the light of Christ. He was given the truth. He, he, he was the leader of the pack that day. And he did a remarkable job. I mean, I mean, he went from somebody who denied Christ three times Christ told him he was going to do it. He did it anyway. And, and then to be as bold and noble as he was that, that day, this day here, hey, man, Peter was awesome. I have a question. Yeah. Is anyone who preaches under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit concerned with political correctness? <laughs> I think not. They shouldn't be. <laughs> David, I like that are, answer. They should. They think, they think they're got the Holy Spirit leading them, but yeah. we won't go there. Yeah. So, yeah, I think the simple answer is is just yeah. We don't need to elaborate on this and go into a lot of detail. Is no, he went with all boldness. The Holy yeah. Spirit was in him. The thing, and Bobby, I like the way you put it. He's a new creation, right? Yes. Paul was a new creation. Right. And each of us are new creations. Praise the Lord. <laughs> yep, absolutely. And with a being a new creation, we have the boldness to speak. I mean, I, I used to, you know, be a little concerned about correctness and, you know, uh, I better not bring up Jesus. That might be wrong. I, I don't think that way anymore. <laughs> Uh, completely opposite thought pattern. You know, I, I mean, we're all human beings. I mean, I was a, a Peter growing up, not kind of believing, but not so much believing and, you know, could w- w- wean off in the wrong direction pretty easy and would, would not defend Jesus where I should have defended him. And we probably have all been through stages like that, but we're a new, when we're a new creation, that doesn't happen anymore. Or if it happens, we repent and, and try not to, to make allow it to happen again. So, yes, I mean, he, he did. He has the boldness of the Holy Spirit. The other thing, if you look at the end of this, uh, verse 34, again, he's pointing to another psalm of David. This is Psalm 110, and he says... For David did not ascend to it into the heavens. So how did he start this? Hey, fellas, you're David. He's dead and gone. As a matter of fact, we know where his tomb is. And we go visit it, and we worship around his tomb. We know where David is. He's dead and gone. So he starts this off, and he says, 
For David did not ascend into the heavens, but says himself, Lord said to my Lord. Well, who's he talking about? The father spoke to the son. They're both Lord. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. That's where Jesus is sitting. How could Peter, being this uneducated, never quoting the Old Testament, walking three years with, with, with Jesus, now all of a sudden has this power of interpreting Scripture in Old Testament that he's able to proclaim this to these Jews, all the Holy Spirit working through him. Now, there were seven points that some commentators brought up for this. Uh, I'm going to go through these re real quickly, and then we're just going to open it, the floor up for uh, any last-minute dis uh, discussion items. Seven points is that the name of Jesus of Nazareth is mentioned eight times uh, throughout the, the this sermon. Uh, he was approved and proved and attested to by God the miracles that he did, the many miracles. If you go back to John in the gospel, he said, if I would have documented all the miracles that Jesus did, the world's not big enough to hold them. So all we got was a glimpse from the gospels. Gospels is just a, a handful of miracles. Jesus did thousands upon thousands upon 10,000s of miracles that are not documented anywhere. And so this was very clear to these folks. You've seen it. And so that was brought out here that you crucified him. That's brought out. That God raised him from the dead. And we're all witnesses. We saw him. We walked. We touched him. And there's more than 500 brothers and sisters that all saw him. So that's the second point, is that he was exalted. We watched him be taken up into heaven in the clouds. We're eyewitnesses of that. And that he's trying to, to get across. And that he sent the Holy Spirit. You saw that. You were witnesses. You heard the noise. You heard the speaking in tongues in different languages. The tongue of fire over their head. All of this you've seen. All this he's putting this out. All for the reason now of preaching the gospel. And what we'll find is a bunch of people come to believe. That's what we'll find at the end of this. And he's basically, though it's not clear, and he doesn't even know he's saying it. It's he's bringing forth right here the birth of the church. So this sermon brings the birth of our church that we are. Jesus Christ's cornerstone. This is the birth of the church right here. He's proclaiming the gospel for really the first time Jesus is gone. He's proclaiming it to all these Jews from nations all over the known world that are in during the festival. And many come to believe, and we'll see that next week. So with that, any last minute discussion items, any last minute wrap up items that we need to discuss. We're right up against our time, but we have a few minutes. So, any other some, items? I'm sorry. Something that really um, uh, jumped out at me tonight, uh, when you were talking about the uh, pain being like the pain of childbirth, um, that is something that I have meditated on so much. If you look at the day that Jesus was crucified, he, his suffering intensified throughout the day and throughout the evening and got worse and worse and worse and worse he was headed towards a glorious resurrection. And it's like the pain of childbirth. Uh, the contractions, they become more and more frequent and more and more painful until there's the glory of the new birth. And Jesus talked about that. You know, when the child is born, the mother forgets about the pain and enjoys the glory of the, the child being there. And Romans 8, uh, verse 20 uh Three says the whole creation is travailing, which the Bible uses the word travailing as childbirth, the pain of childbirth. The whole creation is travailing and groaning. Uh, Peter said, we look, we're looking for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. 
this COVID is a contraction. It's travail. Earthquakes in diverse places, wars, rumors of wars. There's contractions happening because we're headed towards a new birth. One more thing. If you listen to most people's testimonies for Christ, that's their testimony. Their life in sin got worse and worse, more and more painful until they were born again, and they had the glory of a new birth in Christ. And, and so uh, it's, it's a pattern all over the place. You know, it's, it's really amazing how God works. And it's a very good analogy, the, the way you laid it out. That's exactly what we're trying to present is that's what, that was what was happening here. You know, like you said, on the cross, more and more pain, more and more intense. But actually, Christ was looking forward to the fact of the new birth coming out of that on the other side. Yeah. And uh, so it it is pretty amazing, Robert. We're, and Paul wrote. Oh, this is, and Paul uh, wrote that uh, he's the firstborn of creation. He also wrote that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. You know, so yeah, his resurrection was a new birth. You know, uh, Hebrew says for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. You know, it's just it's fabulous. Absolutely. Good. Very good. One thing that popped into my head, I don't even know why it came to my head, but about sci uh, miracles, signs, and wonders. So healing the blind man and giving him his sight, that's a miracle. We know that. The, the flames over their head, that wasn't a miracle. That was a sign. Yeah. The dove landing on Christ wasn't a miracle. That was a sign. Sign. So mm -hmm. that gives that. And then and then the wonders um, are the things that 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 give all and I maybe a wonder would be Jesus gathering all the children around and spending when he's so exhausted and so busy and so much going on that would be a wonder like wow how does, how does that that's not a miracle and it's not a sign so um that is a way to differentiate those things and it just occurred to me not even while we were studying it. yeah and there's, there's different ways to look at it but they are different you know do your study so we enjoy tonight uh um, hope everybody got something out of it. We're uh, actually going to be doing Bible studies tomorrow while we're here in Puerto Rico. We're going to be doing our Acts Bible study. Uh, so wish us luck there and pray for us that that goes well. Uh, so we're doing that tomorrow night. and uh, We'll do that while we're here. So it's a privilege to be able to, to help out while the ministers come. So. Y'all have a great night. Thank you, brothers Thanks. and sisters for being here with us and uh, participating in this study. It means so much for us, for y'all to be here and your involvement and your feedback. Uh, it makes as, it nice. as it was said, iron sharp, as iron sharp sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. So thank you. Let's close in prayer. Okay, good night. Thank We're you, guys. Let's close in prayer real quick. Let's close That's in prayer. Good. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this scripture. Thank you for the boldness of Peter that gives us an example. Thank you for this message very clearly laid out about the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus and his glorification. That is the gospel. And that is what everybody needs to know. And I just pray you would give us this boldness, give us the opportunity to share the gospel. Please be with us as we go through this week. I pray again for all of those on our prayer uh, list um, that your hand would guide them. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 Good night. Good night, guys. Good night. Good night.